welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Empathic Mastery Show. Today, we're going to have a really juicy conversation about near-death experiences and the Blessed Mother and all kinds of other awesome stuff. My guest is Kathy Gabrielson. She is a healer, spiritual teacher, Ayurvedic health coach, a Vedic meditation teacher, graduate teacher of energy medicine, and number one best-selling author of Dying to Live, Surviving Near Death. Kathy crossed the boundary into death once as a teen and another time as a young mom recovering from cancer. She experienced spiritual transformations and discovered her paranormal gifts. Kathy returned to life to help others transform and heal emotional, spiritual, and physical wounds. Kathy is the founder of Connect Through Cancer, the Gabrielson Healing Center, and the Prana Detox. Kathy has a healing practice providing transformational healing sessions via Zoom. Kathy, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I can't wait to dive into this conversation. So as I was saying to you before we jumped on to the recording, I always love to start at the beginning. I love to start with just like, tell us a little bit about young Kathy. Who were you as a kid? Did you know you were an empath? Did you know that you were sensitive? You know, and if you didn't, when did you realize you were one? So tell us a little bit about, you know, let's hear your origin story. My origin story. Okay. Well, I was, uh, one of five kids. I was a twin and I was the youngest. And I never knew I was an empath. I didn't know I was an empath, but I, and I didn't know I was as sensitive as I was. I just knew that I had a lot of stomach aches when I was a really little girl. I knew I was always afraid to be on the bus. I didn't know why people would ask me why I was so upset. And I didn't have an answer. I never had an answer. I would have heart flutterings. Um, and, uh, I was always, always, always a little bit anxious or upset and, but couldn't understand why and couldn't tell my mom why. And I always felt, um, called spiritually. Like, you know, I loved to dress up as saints. I mean, I thought that was really fun, you know, dressing up and trying to be an angel and trying to be a saint. Yes. Uh, Looking back, I think I kind of in my heart always knew I went to Catholic school. So when I was in school, you know, there was this dogma and there was this teaching and we were supposed to fear God and I couldn't understand that. And Mm. I remember when I was in first grade and my teacher asked me, uh, asked all of us to draw a picture of heaven. And I drew a picture of heaven, but my picture of heaven had all these sick people with angels taking care of them in beds. And uh, she just thought it was the funniest thing. Everybody else had rainbows and lollipops and like unicorns. And I couldn't understand why she thought that that wasn't heaven. But now I realize that's what heaven, you know, our our souls, our spirits do is they help us and take care of us. So I didn't know I was empathic. I didn't know until I had um, a near-death experience and was really sick and just really struggled with heart stuff and all kinds of stuff my whole life. And I realize now in retrospect, it was just all empathic energy. I just, yeah, much stuff that wasn't mine. So true. And, you know, you're speaking about how for some of us, like some of us, I, I sort of think of empaths in terms of like, I started thinking about like the elements of air, fire, water, earth. And mm-hmm. how like air empaths are people who tend to get a lot of the thoughts and the perseveration. It, fire empaths are more like they tend to get really agitated and a lot of, you know, energy and action and movement and everything and can sometimes look like a hyperactive kid. 
Water empaths are the ones that I think we classically think of as empaths, the ones who feel everything. And then earth empaths, in my experience, are the ones who get it physically that, you know, and like that stomach aches. And I cannot tell you how many empathic children I've heard of who struggle. Like one of the first things is like stomach aches all the time, you know, but all of these ways that being so highly sensitive was just like your body was taking that hit over and over again. So I love that. Yeah. Sharing that. Yeah. You're so welcome. And then as you start understanding that, like if you have kids and they're highly sensitive and you start thinking about like how as children, like how is it manifesting for them? Then like if you have, for example, you know, a kid who's like a really like an air empath and they just are constantly thinking and perseverating. It's like, then get them dancing, get them moving their body, go Mm -hmm. take them outside and go hug a tree. And like, just all kinds of different ways that we can like, if we recognize the tendency, then we can find the counterbalance to that. I think it's hard in some ways being somebody who's picking it up on a physical level and processing the empathic information on a physical level can be one of the hardest things to deal with because it's like your body is just doing its natural thing. So, yeah. yeah. So you were a teenager the first time you had a near-death experience. Please tell us about this. Yeah, I was um, just a senior in high school and, you know, it was like that special time of year. You're going to graduate. It was the fall. You know, everyone had selected their colleges and um, I was with my boyfriend and we were just in a car on a beautiful, beautiful fall night. And it was a country road and he noticed a a police officer and he he wasn't like he was speeding. There was no drugs. There was no alcohol, nothing like that. um, The night we got in the accident. But I guess he, I think he may have gotten scared or maybe thought, you know, he was speeding or so he saw the police officer and I could tell he, he, he gave it a little bit more gas, more Mm. gas. And, uh, and we were on a country, real country, windy road that I knew he wasn't familiar with. And, um, I just heard the scream in my head saying, put your seatbelt on. And Mm. I, um, obviously was a guide or an angel and I immediately put my seatbelt on and I, I screamed out loud for my boyfriend to do the same, but he didn't. And then the thing I knew we were just in a, in a deep, deep, uh, ravine and, um, our car kind of went off the road. He, well, we went around a curve and instead of taking the curve, obviously he was going a little too fast. And then, uh, we ended up off the road and into an unforeseen, he didn't see it, big open area. And we had trees and mud and dirt. And we were pretty, we were so far down, no one could really see us. And oh, wow. uh, yeah. And so I, we were down, we were down there, which it felt like an eternity. Yeah. Uh, and he was moaning and slumped over the steering wheel. And I remember somebody came to my door and it wasn't really, it was just a mangled. It was no glass. I mean, the car was just completely mangled. All, all the windshield and the windows were shattered. And he just appeared next to me and said, I'm going to get help. And um, I just remember being in that car and being terrified. And I kept asking where we were and what had happened. And then it was like peace and quiet. And then I just remember uh, a stillness. I remember the night. I remember the sky. And I remember it was just like a pull, a pull or a sensation. You know, people talk about tunnels. I, 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 I felt, it felt like a tunnel. It felt like that, but it wasn't like this big, dark abyss, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, then I was just in it. Then I was just there. And I was in, I knew I wasn't in the car and didn't know it was heaven. I didn't know where I was, but I understood that I was being healed from where I was. And I understood that I was going to be receiving a gift to help heal my boyfriend and I would be doing healing. And I can remember seeing these, these people talk. I didn't know who they were at the time. There was always people they were talking and reflecting on it. Now I, uh, I realized it was my grandfather. He was instrumental in there saying it was, it would be too hard for my dad, for me, if I, if I did die. And I just remember hearing, it's not my time. I have a lot of work to do. And so I came back. Wow. Never told a soul, never told a soul. Never told anybody. And um, yeah, that was, it was terrifying because I had already felt like most empaths do. You you feel, already feel different. Yes. And I, I had already felt, 
you know, different than everybody else um, all my life. And so this made me even more exceptionally different because I was yes. that I couldn't share and it was really stressful. But my boyfriend died about nine, was resuscitated nine times that night. And he was in a, he was brain injured in a coma and um, he did survive. He could only blink his eyes for 19 years, but um, oh. I just couldn't, it wasn't for me to talk to people about my trauma. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So I never did. And I was afraid. I was afraid that people would, you know, you're not supposed to be, I wasn't supposed to be worthy of receiving um, divine connection and light. You know, that's just kind of not what I was taught. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not what I believed. And I didn't want people to think I was full of myself or I was special, you yeah. know, that I had the experience. So I never told anybody, never wow. until years later, until after I had my second. Wow. Yeah. And yet I also imagine, and this is such an empath thing. It's like you go through your own experience, but there's this other person who's gone through something that's so much worse that it's almost like you don't want to pull focus away from the tragedy that your boyfriend went through. And it's kind of like, who am I to complain about this or to talk about this when he can only blink now? And yeah, so it's sort of that, like we downplay our own experience, especially when there's been somebody else has been through something that is quote worse, unquote. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So, yeah. You end up in the hospital with that experience, that first experience, or did you, did you like, did they pull you out of the car and you walked away? No, I was in ICU for a week and I, there was something wrong with my heart. They were worried, really worried about my heart, but it's funny. It was like my issue. And I had, I just remember I had, my face was like gone. I had mm. uh, my, I just had my, I had shattered the windshield with my face and they just I mean, I just had, I had glass coming out of my face for years, just, but so I had stitches all over my face. And, but again, at the same time, it was, no one was really, I wasn't interested in what had happened to me. And my boyfriend was on the verge of death and still was like in a, you know, in a coma. And so I, and I asked my mom later what happened. And she said, I don't remember. I just remember it was your heart. They were really worried about your heart. So I wasn't Mm. in care for a week, really bruised, really battled battered, really hurt. But I, you know, I, 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 I came back to do work and I became extremely spiritual after that near death experience, became a minister, um, really connected to Mary and I, you know, prayed to her every day and went to church every day and also went to see him every day and not realizing, not knowing I was an empath and then walking into a hospital situation or um, a nursing home situation or his home, wherever he was day after day, it was heavy. I yeah. didn't realize I didn't realize until years later until I and, and being an empath and this conversation was available. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I truly believe the weight and the energy and the emotion uh, really, really got to me physically. And I developed yes. cancer when I was um, just 32. And I really think that was just my heart. My heart was really filled with, you know, my boyfriend's pain, his mother's pain. Yeah. Just the pain, you know, everybody's pain. Well, and you said you developed breast cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and one of the things I've heard about breast cancer is, I mean, if you think about it, our breasts are what nourish the world, you know? And so when we, so when we give and give and give and give and give, breast cancer is one of the ways that that can manifest. So it seems to me that not only were you picking up and absorbing all the heaviness from all of the people, but especially your boyfriend and his mom, but also all of the ways that you just kept giving and giving and giving and not taking anything for yourself, not claiming space for yourself, not believing you were worthy of being heard. It's Mm -hmm. like, it tracks for me that that would have been how it would manifest is with breast cancer. I mean, do you would know you're, you're the expert here. Do empaths typically move through life with their open heart? Is that, you know, I think so. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that one of the, so, and, and here's the, so one of the things I've discovered is that As empaths, the bottom line is that when we don't know how to sit with discomfort and we don't know how to hold space or manage our own uncomfortable feelings, when we start absorbing other people's feelings and processing them like they're our own, the thing is we feel better when other people feel better. And Mm -hmm. so we will go and try to make things better for people because we get an immediate 
response. Like they feel better, we feel better. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of us just from the very start sense things that are off in the world and sense Mm -hmm. things that are out of balance. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we go and we try to fix it Mm -hmm. because we know that it needs help. Mm -hmm. And it's in some ways, it's like both our blessing. It's like our blessing and our curse. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's like our greatest gift, but it's also our biggest, it's, it's, it's like our biggest piece of kryptonite. Yeah. 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 Healing empathically without even knowing it. Right. 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 And um, so did you continue to see your boyfriend throughout the rest of his life? Were you? I I was I said his eulogy. I was close with his family. I I went to go see him every day for years, every day. And I switched my college um, course and went to school at night and I would visit him during the day. And his mom and I would kind of tag team. And um, I really believed in my heart, again, without having told anybody that I had this purpose to help heal him. And Mm -hmm. so I really thought that, that he at some point would wake up and be okay. And year after day after day, year after year, it wasn't happening. And I started to get really depressed because I, then I started to think I'm, maybe that was really crazy. Maybe that didn't experience didn't happen. Maybe I wasn't told that I'm going to be doing healing work. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be, maybe nothing happened. Maybe it was just a dream, you know? So then I started to doubt my own self and, After about five years, I met my husband and he, he was an angel sent, I'm sure, you know, and uh, his, I mean, his last name was Gabrielson for like, you know, he's like, angel yeah. Gabriel, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. He, he came and rescued me and it was a beautiful, it's been a beautiful story, but, and he was always open. I mean, my boyfriend who was brain injured and could only blink his eyes, he was in the front row at my wedding. He was always a part of my life and he was my greatest teacher because I didn't know then that um, I was learning how to heal by being in the room with him all those Mm. days, every day, Mm. Mm. connecting to guidance and developing my guides and my connection with Mary. And so he brought me an incredible gift. It was a hard gift. It was a hard time of my life when everybody else was, you know, at frat parties or, you know, in sororities or, you know, living, you know, doing stuff in college. I was um, a caretaker to him as best as I could. Yeah. I get the sense, a very strong sense that you did do a lot of healing for him. It just wasn't the physical body healing, but you did like you prepared his soul for his transition. Yeah. And that it was more of a soul healing for him. Yeah. The other thing that I was thinking is, you know, the angel Gabriel is the angel who invites Mary, you know, the angel is the one of the Annunciation, and the angel Gabriel is the one who asks Mary if she will take up her job. And so, you know, I just, it's interesting. You have these, like, just, oh. you've received this calling. Yeah. And then, you know, if you needed, like, another hint from the universe, it's like you meet your husband with the last name Gabrielson. Yeah. Just like, you know, will you say yes to your job? Will you agree to take this on? Yeah, Yeah. I know. And I didn't, I didn't at first, I didn't. And, um, which is why, you know, I thought at that time I had failed my boyfriend. I thought I had failed God. I thought Mm. I, um, as a, as what I was supposed to be doing in this life. And, um, you know, I remember I was, I was really, really, really kind of went into a dark night of the soul. So I went from every day and being a minister to thinking, I just felt, I felt like I left it, let my boyfriend down. I felt like oh. I let him down and Mary down. What didn't I do? Was I supposed to be doing something? Did I not do enough? And then, so then I had breast cancer a few years later. No surprise. Yeah. My heart was hurt. My heart was broken. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah. and the lungs are all about grief. Like this whole area is, mm-hmm. you know, all about holding on to the grief in our bodies as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, my fourth chakra was was shut. It was shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I was in a dark night for quite some time. Um, And then after my breast cancer, I I knew I was always called like you and pass are like you said that need to do more. And then so when I had breast cancer, I had was diagnosed at a really early age, but I had a three year old and one year old at the time, and I 
would be in the hospital and see these other people that had like two jobs and they had babies and they were going to drive up the school bus and they bring their kids there and then go the night. And I just couldn't believe how blessed I was that, you know, my husband was able to support our family and I could go home and be with my kids. Yeah. So I ended up starting a nonprofit after that to help women at that time with cancer, it was cuddle my kids and we would go into homes or a nonprofit. It still exists today, but, and we would go in and do creative play and arts and crafts with young kids that had a parent with cancer. And so I did that for, I, I ran it as executive director before I stepped aside and started and, and handed it off to my, um, the exact next executive director. And I went on to do energy healing. And I really had thought, so by the time I had my second near death experience, I spent all this time in the brain injury community, you know, healing empathically. I yeah. ended up, you know, healing empathically and and helping all these people when they had cancer free all these years and helping these families. And then, so when I went on to have my second near death experience and I went to the other side, I just was thought I was going to stay, you know, I thought mm. I did enough. And um, so that time that was a much more profound experience and much harder to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that next experience. I mean, I'm imagining it was quite the wake up call. It was that time I, you know, like most empaths, you're spending your whole entire life doing everything for so many other people, you know, and we are, we're, we're not a priority. We don't really take care of ourselves very well. At least that's my understanding. Yeah. And I think it's pretty <laughs> common. I think many of our listeners are going to be like, yeah. yeah, I just don't do anything for anybody at all ever, you know, because like you said, it just, just felt so good. And we know empaths know what somebody needs before they even need it. And we're yeah. handed to it before they even ask. And yeah. so the second of my second near-death experience I had just had my 14th surgery for some reconstruction of reconstruction for my breast. I had had a mastectomy and lots of complications of surgical complications, all my own doing because I was an overdoer, over pleaser, over giver. And had every time I had a surgery, I never took care of myself. I just went back to not asking for help, not, you know, doing it all. And um, we were on vacation. It was our first day on vacation. And it was two weeks after my just minor surgery, but it was just a few weeks after. And out of nowhere, I just got violently sick. And, you know, I woke up that morning and went downstairs to get my kids all set up at the pool and get the perfect chairs and perfect seats and make sure everything was perfect for my family when they woke up and came down to the pool. And they came, I, they came down and I was um, laying there, which was really uncommon because I would have gone for a run or I would have done something. And they came down kind of like, what the heck are you doing? And I just went back to the room and I, I just said to them before I left, I'm sick. And then I went back to the room and I woke up in my own urine on the bathroom floor and I knew that I was really, really sick. So I had started to develop sepsis. Oh. So not taking care of myself after that 14th surgery really hit me in the behind. Yeah. And um, so the next thing I can really remember, I was in and out of it, was I was in the hospital and I remember the surgeon saying that if they don't re-remove my breast, then I'll be on life support. And so I just, here I am, I'm like on an island in Florida vacation with my family and within, you know, 24 hours, I'm losing my breast again. And I thought, oh. wait. That happened. What? What are you? What's going on here? So, you know, I just thought it was just in a dream. And then I said, "Just wait, wait, wait. I got to think about this. Is that what I want to do?" And um, they said, "You don't have a choice." Mm. Next day, or later that afternoon, I woke up without a breast, and I woke up terribly sick, and I couldn't breathe. And mm. what? The, and no one would listen to me. I kept saying, "I can't breathe." And they said, "Oh, it's common after surgery." And I thought, "I've had fourteen. I know it's yeah. Happening. You know, you know. And no, I just felt like I wasn't being heard, and I wasn't. And then you don't want to be that person that complains, like, "Oh, I can't breathe," you know. Yeah. So, but I did know that uh, the surgeon had accidentally cut some blood vessel, and I was bleeding internally. And I, no one knew it then. Um, no one knew it at the time, but. I knew something was wrong. And I remember I was in the hospital for you know, a week. And I remember telling my mom when she would come to visit and my husband, I would say, I'm dying. And they said, no, you're not. And I said, yeah, I know I am. I knew I was dying because I had that sensation before. And there is this you know, space that you go into. And I was before you die. And I could, I remember, I remember that feeling. And I remember kind of looking at myself and seeing this opening and, you know, almost seeing myself above the bed. But one of the things that was so powerful, because I had worked with people that had cancer for so many years and, and mothers and people, fathers that had died. 
and you see them suffering so much, right? We, we see people in different illnesses and diseases and so we often see them suffering, but I looked like I was suffering, but it, but I was in this really amazing space that, you know, I couldn't really talk. I was having a hard time breathing. I was having a hard time talking, but it was this, just this unbelievable sense of peace. And I knew that my kids would be okay. And then my husband would be okay. There was no worry. I entered the the place that there was no more worry. There was just mm. no worry. And then I crossed over. And that time it was much more profound. And um, I remembered more. And I also had, I was, at, I was there longer. And so I remember when I first crossed over, I saw all these people. It was like a welcome party. And people that I knew and people that I didn't. And it was just so many people. And then I was kind of, you know, going, I want to say going higher, but, but continuing on in a way. And I remember seeing angels and I remember hearing the most unbelievable music. And then I saw the master healer, Jesus. And I do know that when people have a near death, they see the version of their God, or they see their own divine feminine, or they see yeah, yeah. whoever and I saw him and behind him was his mother. Mm. And um, I saw him and I was crying. I remember I was crying. So I was really interesting that I was crying in heaven, but it just proves that there's people, there's still emotions, you know, there's something yes. that's on. Yes. And I remember crying. And then I, I understood he started to, you know, shake his head and he said, I'm so sorry. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. I knew I had to go back and it was like, I knew I had to go back, but I really wanted to stay there right there with him. And yes. I just wanted to be there. And I, I thought, okay. And, and I said to him, what do I have to do? And he said, you have to do the work very, I had to do it. And so when I came back from that near death experience, I was terribly anxious, depressed and had PTSD and, you know, had picked up all this this, this trauma and had experienced all this trauma. And, and then I came back and I really felt like I had failed God again. I feel, oh. I feel like I, like I failed Mary again. You know, I prayed You've to her. Spoken like a church. true Catholic parochial school child. I know. <laughs> what did I do wrong? How come I can't get in that place with, you know, and then I was really, really depressed, really anxious. Mm. And, um, I, you know, I had suicidal ideation. I um, was smoking all the time and you know, I started smoking. I just was just a wreck. Um, yeah. I found energy medicine and I found an amazing spiritual teacher and started to meditate. And I real what I realized was that I needed the work I needed to do was that I had spent my whole entire life doing everything for everybody, but I couldn't do the work until I really connected with myself and made myself a priority and really got to know my needs and my wants and that he loved me just like as much as he loved everybody else. But I had to get to know myself and I spent my whole life as an empath and I couldn't even tell, I could tell you every, every everyone else's favorite food and their favorite color, but I could never tell you my own. And I just didn't know. And yeah, I just didn't know myself and I didn't, and my whole life, I didn't even care to, I didn't right. even, like, uh, I wasn't even like I cared to. Yeah. So that's, I, I had to get to my own core and I had to do the work I had to do was myself so that I could really truly help other people. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and that, you know, you were saying like, I just, I can totally imagine like Jesus is like, Hey, sorry, but you kind of got to go back there. <laughs> and I've, I've absolutely heard that from a number of people who've had near death experiences that it's so exquisite on the other side. It's just so delicious yeah. that you, you really don't, want to come back like it just and but there is that point where you're just like okay I got the you know I have to come back let's talk about the work because you know we and this is something I think a lot of us in the in the healing world talk about we talk about you got to do the work but I'd love to talk about like what's how do you define that what what does it mean to you what did it mean when you were told basically you're gonna have to go back and you got to do the work the work I knew that I had to do was to help, you know, channel energy of Mary. I knew I had to bring, I I, I knew, I, I didn't know right at that moment. I knew I had to come back and do work, but I didn't know what I needed to do. And I was 
kind of like, Jesus, can't you just tell me what it is? You know, please tell me what it is that I have to do. And it'll be so much easier. I could do the work for you right away. But mm. it was history. And, um, but I was really understanding the work was that I had to really accept the fact I had to believe and I had to accept the gifts that I had and, and, and accept the fact that I was worthy of them. And I, I had to accept the fact that I was worthy of what he was giving me, what, what I was given on the first near death experience. And then what I was given again in the second near death experience. Yeah, yeah. And I had to understand that I had the connection with him. I had that. We have all had that connection. I just had to um, believe and trust that I was worthy. Getting to that point was the work, you know, yes. that the work, you know, yes. Kind of being like, okay, your name's Kathy. What do you like to do? You know, it's kind of like having a new house guest and trying to make them comfortable and happy. And I had to get to know myself right? and I had to get rid of the anxiety. And I, it was really in doing all that, that I realized that I had just been carrying a tremendous amount of energy and weight that wasn't mine. Yeah. As those layers came off, I felt I felt with every layer that came off, it's interesting. It's like I was a layer closer to that, that feeling of heaven again. You know, it was just like, it was a layer of weight and then us, and then light would come through. And then as every layer came off and more awareness about myself and my abilities and, and trusting and accepting who I was and why I was here and why I was different, it was as if just the light started to shine brighter. And that's really was really powerful for me to get to that point. And so yes. I, I think I can authentically do his work. I think we all, we all, everyone here on your show, all, all of us, you know, we're here and for a really great reason. And one of the things that I know the empath, you know, it's like that we can't stop doing, like you said earlier, we just can't stop doing. But what I had to believe and I had to accept and trust and what we all have to believe and we have to accept and that we have to trust is that we have a light within us that is so incredibly bright. We are light workers and that sometimes we have to do nothing. We nothing. just be in the room. And when I yeah. look back on my experience with my boyfriend, Tim in the hospital, I was healing him with my own light. I was healing yeah. him with my own energy. I was healing with my own presence and never gave myself credit because I thought I had to be swabbing him, had to be cooling him, had to be patterning him, you know, had to be talking to him, you know, had to be doing all these things. And in the end, um, the greatest healing that I really gave him was just my presence and my open heart without yes. working. And your love that you showed up over love, and over yeah. again. Yeah. Was he was he one of one of your was he in the welcome party when you got to the other side? You know what? I think my what with that's really interesting. I because people have asked me that before. I didn't see him in my welcome party. And huh. I truly believe that was not him. That was me. That was yeah. my fear of that would, that, that still, that still there is a part of me that feels, I don't think I'll ever get over that I survived and that he didn't and that he died and that I, that it didn't work out the way I thought it was work out. There's, there's I, some, just, I just heard in my head, Kathy, I survived for 19 years. <laughs> excuse me I just got the chills Ooh. like I just heard like excuse me, like 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 how how much longer did you need me to be alive in order to feel like like it's like I did not die in that car accident I know. oh I know but he suffered oh he suffered oh he suffered 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 but that's so true you know you just channeled him right there yeah yeah, no, he, I, I he, he, he's, he's very dry he had a very yeah. dry he had yes it's yes. it, 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 he his sense of humor when he, my sense is that he actually had an extremely, would have had a very mature, very witty sense of humor had he gotten a little bit older. He was a little bit spazzy yeah. at the age that he got into the accident. Yeah, and um, he nailed it. And so, so his sense of humor was a little bit more like kind of just like jerky boy yeah. humor. But as he got, but there's a drollness to him. He's just this very witty, dry kind of like. Yeah. 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 He's here with me and yeah. there was, I've had some illnesses and stuff and he made his presence and says, you know, I was there, I'm there for you. Like you were there for me. I know he's always been there, but I've always just been, you know, I've just, you know, that, that, that fear has kept my distance, yeah. even yeah. though he's right with me. And so thank you for bringing him in here today. Oh. I feel his presence and I still do. And yeah. you just cleared something for me that, yeah. you know, 
disappeared. So thank you. Thank you. Well, and I really hear that a big piece of the work for you, and it, this just, to me, this is like, so the Catholic church is like, you know, you are a lowly worm and you're not, and you are unworthy. But that uh, what I'm really hearing is that it's like the journey for you, the work for you has been about the claiming of your worth, the recognizing of your worth and giving yourself permission to say, yes, I know what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm here. I'm ordained to do this work on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but right on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the self-worth stuff. I mean, we could do an entire podcast episode about self-worth and empaths because I think that this is so common for so many of us is that we just feel so like, unworthy. And then, I mean, add just being female on top of that and how so many of us feel like imposters and frauds and mm-hmm. all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, but I didn't know that, um, like I, I didn't know the, really the word empath. I didn't know any yeah. of that so much later. And, but right. now it's like, now I have such clarity and now I know how I move through life. And that's important. You know, am I moving through my, you know, my moving through like that guilt of, oh, I have to help somebody or, you know, well, why am I making the decision to do something and how important it is to hold space and just have my light and presence just be there, you know? Yes. And, you know, you're, as you're saying this, I think trusting that simply being is often enough Like that part, as you were saying that, it's like just to simply be a presence of light in a space is enough. Enough. And I know that for me as an empath, the other part of it is getting out of that illusion or that lie that we're the only ones who can do it. That Mm -hmm. if we don't do it, nobody's going to be able to do it. That there's nobody that's going to be able to pick up the slack. That it's Mm -hmm. like somehow, and, and so it's like we have to run ourselves ragged we don't get to rest. We don't get to stop. We don't get to, we don't get to have space for ourselves because this idea of we're the only, because we can see it, we can feel it. It's our responsibility to heal it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think one of the most powerful healings as an empath was coming to understand that I'm one, Mm -hmm. I'm one light in I'm, I'm a spark. I'm a glimmer. I'm a, you know, I am a spark of the divine, but I am not all of it. Mm -hmm. And I can trust that I do my job and other people get to do their jobs and all together will be enough, Mm -hmm. but it's not my responsibility to do all of it. And just knowing like, it's okay to rest. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to stop. Because mm-hmm. that's something, and I, you were saying that earlier about, you know, you just could not stop. You were going mm-hmm. and going and going. I mean, you felt like complete, total butt. And, and I mm-hmm. don't mean B-U-T, I mean B-U-T-T. <laughs> and yet, you know, and you're arranging the furniture and you're getting everything ready. And, you know, for this, day at the, you know, for like this, this family vacation day. And it's just like, at what point do you stop? Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, like most empaths, we stop and we fall apart. You right. Know? Right. Stop. We stop <laughs> when the, when we either get ourselves into an accident, like we get it. And actually car accident. One of my very first wake up calls was a car accident. Interestingly, unholy. I was born on Christmas day and I was in a car accident on Holy Thursday. My oh. joke is that if it had been good Friday, the story would be completely different. I would not be here <laughs> telling you this, but yeah, for me, like a car, the car accidents, are such a wake up call. Health issues can be such a wake up call, but it's kind of like the universe is like, Hey, are we, are you going to stop? Are yeah. you going to stop? Yeah. 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 This is, that's my thing. And I know when it, when I get sick, I'm like, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got it. I got it till next time. But I'll okay. Stop. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a blessing. It really is to be able to um, understand and to know and have the awareness of, you know, who we are. And then again, like you said, to believe and to really trust, you know, that we are worthy. It's, and that we can stop and be that spark of light. You know, I have, I worked with a lot of cancer patients over the years and I had, you know, I've never 
forget a woman that came to me. She couldn't drive. Uh, her husband dropped her off. She was near the end. And, and I felt like when she came, it was almost like, um, like you had said earlier, it was like a soul preparation. It felt like the healing was really a soul preparation. And, and she was so upset because she just felt like she could do nothing. She sat on the couch. She laid in bed. She couldn't do anything for herself. She had to do, she just couldn't do anything for months. She was just too weak and too sick. And that was so hard for her. To yes. Do nothing. But yes. I said to her, but you are doing, in the nothing, you are doing everything. Mm-hmm. What an amazing teacher you're being. You're teaching everyone else how patience and love and compassion. And what a great teacher you're being just by being you, by being present without working, you know, just, just being present. And that's hard, really hard to remember. It really, it really is. It really is just that the the worthiness of just taking up space in mm-hmm. a world that is, I mean, we're in, I mean, with hustle culture and, you know, 10Xing everything and productivity and all of the, like the way that capitalism has infiltrated everything in our world so that we don't feel worthy of simply being. Mm-hmm. And yet sometimes I think the healing our soul needs is that space to simply be. My mom is still alive, at least as of the recording of this, maybe by the time it airs, she'll be on the other side. But my mom has been struggling with severe dementia for a really long time. And yet my mother spent her entire conscious life uh, perseverating about everything. Like she Mm -hmm. was like a complete, like highly sensitive empath who worried about everybody and everything and just gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave. And And what's been interesting is she's had this period now that has been going on for years. I mean, we're talking like years that she has been slowly just losing the ability to recognize like she doesn't have the conscious awareness of herself anymore or Mm. of her prey of of like of her purpose or her place she just simply is now Mm. and yet you know she's had this time in which she just gets to be without all the catholic guilt Mm. without all of the you know, the perfectionism without all of the people pleasing, without all of the caretaking and the worrying and the concern, Mm -hmm. her body is just simply having the opportunity to be and to receive love, to receive support and to just be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've actually been asking, we've all been asking the question, Shirley, what is keeping you here? Like we've all been, (laughs) we've all been asking this question. And I think I just answered, like, I think I just got it at a whole new level of like, she spent her entire life, you know, up until her late 70s, early 80s, like just this dynamo of do, 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 do. And now she's like, her soul is, her body is having this opportunity to decompress for her soul. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's so hard. It's so hard to see our parents, you know, suffer in any way, but it sounds like she's got an amazing light and, um, she really does. I mean, I learned my mother, my mother was a psychiatric nurse and a hypnotherapist and a really gifted healer. And I learned so much of what I learned. You know, I've done, I've done personally tons of classes and courses and yada, 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 and certifications and trainings and, and degrees and all that stuff. But honestly, I feel like I learned more by just being in her presence and understanding what it is to be a healer as you know, she was first, she was a nurse and then she went into psychology and being a psychiatric nurse. And then she became this hypnotherapist helping people. But I really feel like so much of what I've learned in doing my work actually has come from her. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Lucky you. She sounds spectacular. Yeah. I have, I was really lucky to have really amazing parents. And um, I mean, they certainly warts and all. They, I mean, like, I, you know, you talk to my adolescent self, I'm sure she would be like, <laughs> but I was very, very blessed to have, and am very blessed to have really wonderful parents. Did, yeah. did she know that she was an empath? Do you no. think? 
No. no, because she left the Catholic Church, she threw the baby out with the bathwater. She was like, there is no God. There is, you know, like she was very like, mm -mm. and so while she was open to intuition and psychic stuff, there was definitely a line for her about of like, not like, like just, there was a lot of stuff that she just kind of was like, not her. Mm -hmm. So she was very very focused on allopathic medicine, very focused on, you know, I mean, she obviously was a hypnotherapist, so she was interested in kind of more of that sort of alternative stuff. But there was a way in which like her trauma being raised as a Catholic, um, especially before Vatican II, really informed, like really kind of acted as almost like a gateway or a door that stopped her from fully recognizing what mm -hmm. she was and who mm -hmm. she was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we are getting to that place or we are at that place where it's like, oh my goodness, Kathy, I cannot believe how fast the time has gone by. <laughs> and I always say that. And I'm always like, I really cannot believe how fast the time has gone by. I could talk with you about I mean, I could talk with you about the Blessed Mother, about car accidents as your wake up call, about worthiness, about near death. I mean, just so many, so, so much richness. One thing, actually, one question that I have for you, and it sounds to me like, I mean, it sounds like you really did have a lot of PTSD on the other side of, I mean, getting nicked by a doctor and then developing sepsis like that, excuse my life, that sucks. Like, yeah. yeah. And so it's really understandable how anxious you would have been coming, like your body was coming out on the other side of that. I wonder, in addition to that, if having experienced like being on the other side, being like going to heaven and having the connection with all of these people that are on the other side, feeling that peace, feeling that grace. Did that change your sense of the nature of the world? Because I know there are so many people who like get so caught, like they, they believe in the spiritual but then they're like, but there are starving children in, in XYZ country, or there's a war here, there's a war here, there, there's a, this, that, and the other thing. Did experiencing that level of, oh, there's so much more than this physical body, how did that change you? Like, yeah, it was, you know, coming back that second time, it was again, you know, I remember, you know, saying to my sister, you know, I, I just saw Jesus again. I was afraid to tell people that I, you know, that I saw Jesus, you know, but when I came back, it was, I was a completely different person because I had been there and I wanted to go back. And it was, if what suddenly my sole purpose became my whole driving force that I knew that I was here for some particular reason and that that was my whole focus and everything that had bothered me before really didn't bother me anymore you know mm. it didn't it didn't matter I knew that there, there was degrees of glory in heaven because I can remember feeling the sensation of moving and seeing people at higher levels of vibration and for some reason, I came back and I, I just have this longing to get there, to really, to get back, to be able to go to the other side and really make a difference. And that's one of the things that I experienced. And I know for sure is that, you know, obviously there is no death, you know, right. we, we continue to live on the spirits, our guides, our, our ancestors, our angels, they're literally right here with us. Yes. The only block is our own fear or our own attachment to some belief that we can't connect with them. But what I do know is that you can do a tremendous amount of work for the, the world, for humankind, for whatever, from the other side. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to, I believe that the next time I go, that that is what I, I want to live here on earth so that I can do greater work when I get there. Yes, yes, yes. and. It seems to me that we are also in the place you said it, you know, you understand there is no death that, you know, that they are all here. And it seems like a lot of people are talking about as we break out of the 3D into the 5D, 
and coming into this understanding of the world in a new way that, you know, the distinctions between spirit and form is going to get a lot more like it's like what we the concreteness of of this world Mm -hmm. seems to be in the process of shifting and um you know i just get the sense that you are here to bring heaven to earth Mm -hmm. that part of what you're here to do is to say there is so much more and my takeaway from this conversation right now is very much that all we need to do is simply be mm-hmm. and that is that is more than enough mm-hmm. like if we are truly shining our light and being present in our heart that is enough that is enough that's yeah. it i yeah. believe the same thing and it just coming to that awareness you know just coming to the awareness that I just had a, we have to learn how to sit with ourselves and sit in that space yes. and that, and, you know, realizing that that light and that peace and that love and that sensation is really available here. And now I don't, we don't have to die to experience it. No. We have to trust that it's within us and it's accessible to us and just yeah. go deep. Just go dive for it and um, really trusting that it's there. And, you know, I always hear Mary saying, you know, lead all souls to, her, you know, it's how important it is to lead the souls to heaven. And and what it's I'm realizing is that just leading souls to heaven here on earth and letting them know that they have access to it. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, for me, it's the sacred heart. It's like the heart is the portal to all of it. And that when I live in my heart, I find my way to, you know, the heaven that this earth can be. Mm-hmm. Okay, so final questions. First one is the what else? What would you kick yourself if you did not say it on this podcast? Oh boy. If I did not say it, I would kick myself, especially yeah. being here with you, yeah. is that if everybody could understand and trust and accept that Mary is the spiritual mother that will receive all of our sufferings and hardships if we just hand them over to her. And if we want to release that burden or release the burdens of that we carry from other people, just hand them to her. And she's um, waiting for us to, to do that. We just have to ask for the help. And that's true of all the spirit world that, you know, they just don't, I don't believe in my experience that they they come and just become a nuisance and and do things for us that they think are best for us. We have to ask. We have to call. We have to ask. We have to ask. We have have to ask. There and she's for us and um and she's willing to take everything is that we need to hand her, but we just have to ask for her and then we have to believe and we have to trust that she's going to intervene. Well, and we have to say yes. You know, going back to the Annunciation, yep. Yep. it's yep. like the yes. the angel Gabriel shows up and says, "Hey, would you like to do this thing?" But we have to agree to it, and that's yep. the, you know, we have to ask for the help, and we then have to accept the help. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and I didn't, and most empaths don't ask for help, and they don't accept. No, help. we kind of stink at it. And you know, one of the thing <laughs> theories I actually have about why one of the reasons we are not great at receiving is because we're already receiving so much. Mm -hmm. that we will often try to block or protect ourselves from taking in more. And so it it ironically means we often take in the, the, all the toxic sludge that's going on in the world, but it's almost like we can't necessarily add the energy, you know, helpful energy because it's almost like too much as well as I've certainly had the experience of receiving quote help unquote, where from somebody who, you know, not only was I necessarily getting their help, but I was also picking up on all of their worries and their concerns and their stuff. And I think that's the thing about it as an empath is that we do need to be a little discerning about who we receive help from because some people have the best intentions, but they're they're hot messes. And Mm -hmm. as an empath, we can really feel that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is our time travel exercise. (laughs) <laughs> Yay. And so the way I always explain this, and I try to keep it short and sweet, and I really believe that podcasts exist outside of time. You know, they sit on a server and people are going to be listening to this episode for years. Like, you know, it could be 30, 35, I mean, not 30, 35, maybe, well, maybe, but 20, 35. And somebody's going to be hearing this message. 
And I really believe we drop the broadcast is like a like a pebble that we drop or a stone that we drop in the river of time and it ripples both ways. And so not only are we sending ripples forward, but we're sending the ripples back to a time that, you know, when we need the message. So we're going to go back to a younger Kathy and we're going to give her something she needs. And instead of it just being, I would tell her this, I want to go back and talk to her. Like you get to talk directly to her. You get to tell her like, you are this, you are okay. Like you are loved, whatever. So questions are where, when are we going back to? And um, what are you saying? Okay. So I'm traveling back to me yeah. at a point in time in my life. And doesn't matter how old I was. Doesn't matter. It's where it's the time. It's the time that your soul needs you. Like it's so we're traveling back to a point where you're needed, where you your wise older self is needed by your younger self. My wise older self. It would it would have been when I can remember um, breaking down. I was 19 years old and I was in my bedroom and I was able to really sob at the experience that I was in, feeling like a failure and praying to God and um, telling him that I felt like he had forsaken me, that I um, felt alone and I was scared. And I um, didn't think that um, anybody was there for me or anybody understood. And what I say to myself now is that I know in that moment that I was actually in his arms and he was holding me and I was surrounded by all the angels and his mother's mantle wrapped around me and I was never alone and that I just didn't understand that what I was experiencing was necessary for me in my life to do the work, to help him and to lead people to him. Yeah. So what I'm hearing that she needs to hear is you are not alone. Mm -hmm. You are surrounded by angels. You are wrapped in the blessed mother's mantle. You are completely supported. And while you may feel alone and while this may be a really hard and scary time, you are being prepared for the amazing work that is ahead of you. And I also hear to say, and you are so worthy of this. You are so worthy. You deserve this. You were born for this work. That's why you're here. And we love you. Thank you. Yeah. It's a gift. Thank you so much. I was not expecting that. Yeah. Chills. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I also got the sense that you, a little part of you went back in time to the accident and went, put on your seatbelt. <laughs> like, yeah. I actually yeah. brought it back. I know. So listen to me. <laughs> your seatbelt I know maybe that's me going back yeah. like Kathy put on your seatbelt now yeah, yeah. Well, okay like, that's the darkest time was thinking that you hadn't done enough yeah. yeah oh man it just you know and so often I was having a conversation actually with another podcast interviewee my mentor Joanna Hunter the other day and we were talking about this time in her life where she was homeless and where they had been kicked, they had, they had left one apartment and they were, they couldn't find another one for like a month. And at the time it was just the worst thing ever. But in hindsight, it's like the universe was setting everything up because in order to qualify for the house that was their dream home, they actually had to be homeless and they actually needed to be homeless for like, so they were homeless for the minimum amount of time necessary to be able to qualify to get this place. And it just so happened that their kid, who would have been going off to college like a month or two later, was there with them. So they qualified not for a three bedroom apartment or house, but for a four bedroom house. Mm -hmm. And all of these things like completely like worked in their favor. But at the time, it looked like, oh, my God, everything is going to hell in a handbasket. But in hindsight, it was like, no, this is the universe setting things up to be divine and perfect so that you really get what you need. And I think that, you know, 
as you were saying what you were saying, I just thought about that. It's like sometimes we don't know that it's exactly what we need to be ready for the big piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so final question. How do we find you? Um, well, you can find me um, through my website, kathygabrielson.com. And I'm on Instagram at Kathy Gabrielson. And um, also on Facebook at uh, Kathy Gabrielson Healing. But I've just been so happy to be here with you. I I, I, I love your podcast. I, I think you're such an amazing human, oh. light soul. And I feel I'm just a different person after being here with you. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Kathy. This is this has been such a divine appointment. And I just it's been such a pleasure. And I could talk with you for hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Oh, and guys, if you're listening to this and you're like, uh, where do I go? Come on over to empathicmasteryshow.com. All of the links will be in the show notes, including a link for Kathy's book. Thank you. Thank you. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time. Hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.